Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the second panel uh, of Quantify Conference. Uh, this is a cell site uh, panel, um, and it's called uh, The Impact of uh, Recent Regulation on uh, Banks' Liquidity. And uh, we all know how important uh, is liquidity and financing for banks. Uh, we uh, learned it in a hard way. Uh, back during financial crisis and uh, both on uh, global economy level and on personal level. It's uh, when you go to a bank's ATM and you can't uh, withdraw cash and it says uh, insufficient funds and you don't know if we talk about you or them. Uh, but that's in the past and uh, lessons were learned, uh, we hope, and uh, regulators work hard to uh, create plethora of different uh, methods and um, um, uh, metrics, uh, and banks are busy uh, in digesting this and uh, uh, assessing uh, what impacts this regulation have uh, on their funding and on their liquidity. And that will be a topic, some issues uh, we'll cover during this panel, and we have a great panel today. Uh, very experienced uh, panelists. Uh, let me uh, introduce uh, the panel. Uh, first is uh, Gonzalo Garcia Kenny. Uh, he is managing director, head of counterparty um, optimization with Citigroup. Uh, he is responsible for managing counterparty exposure and optimizing trading program offerings to clients. Uh, next is uh, Frank Sanson. Uh, senior Vice President um, and Treasurer of uh, China Construction Bank, uh, second largest bank in assets uh, globally. Uh, Frank is responsible for all Treasury activities uh, in the uh, US. And uh, uh, the last but not least, uh, Steve Hagman, uh, Managing Director and Liquidity Risk Officer with uh, SOCGEN. Uh, his responsibilities are independent review of liquidity risk for U.S. Uh, entities. So we have uh, today a senior trader, a senior um, risk uh, manager, a head of treasury, and uh, uh, this, uh, they can represent uh, different aspects and different views on liquidity and funding. And that's what we want to give you. We want to give you a coverage from different um, uh, point of views. And how we decided to uh, structure this panel, uh, to make my life easier, I will ask each uh, panelist the same question. Uh, what is the most pressing issue in your line of duty? And let um, uh, panelists uh, talk about this and then uh, other panelists will comment on this, and that's uh, um, how uh, basically we want to um, cover this. And uh, uh, then we'll have uh, 10 minutes for Q&A. Uh, so without further ado, let me ask Gonzalo. Gonzalo is head of um, uh, Exposure XV Desk, um, Apple optimi optimi Optimizing Desk. Uh, what is the most pressing issue? What uh, would you like to tell us about uh, liquidity and funding? Sure. Um, <clears throat> uh, the import, important factor that uh, came new uh, this year, impacting trading desks, uh, was the new margin requirement for non-clear derivatives. So I'll expand a little bit on that, and then we'll discuss how uh, we cope with that. Uh, uh, one of the financial institutions that make markets for clients for the buy side, and uh, how do we price in any potential costs, and how did it benefit that new regulation? Uh, the first part is that regulation relates to the following. Um, we offer markets to clients. So if a client wants to enter into an interest rate swap or buy an FX option, or buy insurance against a corporate bond through a credit for swap. We are there and we make a market. We offer a bid and an ask. Uh, and we, as any other market maker, we include costs in those bid asks. Um, it trades at, at market level. And uh, in the past, uh, we could do, let's say, uh, trade an interest rate swap with a client, big size, and then we hold that position, we warehouse that risk for a, a few days, and then we unwind that with another client. 
now that uh, possibility is less, it's more restricted. When we receive an order, in particular, a big order from a client, a credit for swap uh, or other derivative, or even a, a bond, by, the, by that matter, uh, what we typically do is we turn around and go, we go into the intra-dealer market, where other um, institutions similar to Citi, where I work, JP Morgan, Goldman, uh, Morgan Stanley, Barclays, Sockgen, uh, are uh, present in that market, and we tend to unwind part of that order from a client. Um, what resulted as a result of this is that we trade a lot among banks and dealers. And uh, regulators saw that we were not being very efficient. And uh, at the same time, that, that was the part where we were not uh, posting any margin among ourselves. So the new regulation is uh, implying that we need to uh, post not only daily variation margin, the mark to market, to our counterparties, but also we have to post an initial margin or independent amount or an extra amount of collateral to cover us for the potential default of our counterparty. Uh, it is a phased in regulation, uh, but in the, main, in the first phase that started September this year, most of the biggest firms have been uh, included in the rule. So what we have is a lot of uh, trading in and out, and we have to post margin. Regulators gave us two alternatives. One, you calculate that initial margin, that, vari that uh, independent amount, using a percentage over notional, depending on the product. Or you come up with a model that covers a one tail risk for, with a confidence interval of 99%. So over a period of 10 days. So we compared, obviously we were very inefficient, and the percentage over notional is never really linked to directly linked to risk. So the best thing to do is to develop a model that properly covers the risk of that. We came with that model. And we are now posting initial margin to each other in the intra broker market. And uh, as a result of that, the good part is that if we, any of these counterparties defaults, we have more collateral. Uh, that, for some of the CVA traders that are here, you will notice that the credit value adjustment reserve is decreased because we have now some collateral, some initial margin that compensates for that MPOR or market period of risk, that, those 10 days. Um, but there's a, if, uh, a, another hand of that, or the, other, the other side of this story, is that we also need to post that initial margin. And that initial margin is to be posted not directly to our counterparty, but in a third party segregated custodian. Um, so, uh, that generates a cost, a funding cost. FVA in some circles, MVA because it's directly related to margin is a result of that. And that is what we need to price in. So that is the liquidity that uh, it's uh, impacting the financial markets right now. Um, we believe that a few changes have happened. For certain products, this is very expensive and you will see that maybe there's a repricing of certain aspects um, where execution may, be, may have a broader bid or ask, or if we receive as a prime brokers, we may have to increase a little bit of fees. For now, we didn't see a significant impact and we are working on optimization. Uh, we saw definitely that some products that are more plain vanilla have migrated to a clear environment and those that remained uh, unclear decreased a little bit in, in, in liquidity. That is the case for credit markets, where I used to trade uh, credit default swaps. Uh, credit default swaps that cleared have gained in liquidity, while those uh, that do not clear, remember that you can buy this insurance in different sectors, and some names can be clear, some issuers can be clear, but some other ones cannot yet. So those have decreased a little bit liquidity. That is the main impact, the first impact, and then I will be open to questions, not to use more of the time. How do you optimize this? Uh, how can you optimize uh, this new uh, kind of uh, cost? The, the very, very good, uh, very good question. The, and we are looking for, by the way, we are looking for vendors to help us out. Uh, uh, <laughs> anyone around? 
There are two thoughts that we have. Uh, it's very difficult that we can agree on ourselves, the, 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 all the banks and dealers, on how to do it. We can do some bilateral, but remember that I mentioned we, we trade. We, so one day we receive a, a credit for swap from a big client buying protection, let's say, Verizon, example. So we turn around and we bought protection to a lesser, uh, in lesser amounts to some of the other dealers. Then a client wanted to, sell, to buy protection themselves on Verizon, so we sold to them. But then we had hedged our trade with uh, client A, the first client that came uh, to see us. So we now have to turn around and do the opposite trade with the other banks and dealers uh, on something that we could have hedged if we didn't uh, pre-hedge before. So we have a lot of longs and short with different counterparties. The first thing that we think that we have to do is try to optimize that. We are facing longs with Goldman, short with Morgan Stanley, long with SoftGen, and maybe we are net a small long with uh, Bank of China. So maybe the objective is to make sure that we can tear up trades that on a whole are really repeats and maintain the, uh, the net amount, the net exposure that we have, that we want to hold. Other things is make sure that we can move um, the, the more plain vanilla risk to clearing houses. Uh, even in options, you have, uh, for this model, you calculate three layers, delta, vega, and gamma. But if you think about it, delta is a very plain vanilla concept. The thing is that that delta may be embedded in an option, but if we can strip that out and make sure that we can include it in one of the plain vanilla products that is cleared, that's one of a brainstorming that more of the quantitative uh, groups could be doing, could be helping us. Uh, with pleasure. Uh, so, uh, thank you, Gonzalo. Uh, let me ask uh, Frank. Uh, Frank is uh, treasurer of, uh, uh, as we said, the uh, second uh, largest uh, bank globally and responsible for all the funding activity in the uh, United States and North America. What's your uh, kind of most pressing issue? Um, so, um, first, thanks for having me today. Uh, most pressing issue, um, I guess, for all bank uh, management on the, the balance sheet side is always ensuring you have enough liquidity uh, and ensuring you're prepared. So I uh, just uh, thought, uh, just to get things a little more active, um, we had the big election last night. So just a show of hands, who voted for Trump? Who voted for Clinton? No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> um, but um, I don't know if you're following it. And you, it you almost got us. <laughs> almost got it. Um, we'll ask you later. Um, <laughs> What was interesting was last night is that at one point, I think the Dow futures were down 800 points. So I don't know here in this room who, anybody that is, we're all involved with liquidity, at that point, who got a little pit in their stomach and thought about tomorrow and said, or today, because last night, or today, um, am I prepared for tomorrow? So I think that's the most uh, pressing issue. Um, and that's what we always are. So I'm going to just go a little background for myself to try and give you a little sense of where I come from and how I think about things and how over time, as you can see, I have a lot of experience with the gray hair. Um, before, I was, before I was with the China Construction Bank, I started out uh, with National Bank of Kuwait. The National Bank of Kuwait, um, uh, we had the local U.S. operation. And if we go back long enough, if you recollect, there was the first Iraq war. And the first Iraq war was where the uh, National Bank of Kuwait was the first actual uh, commercial bank that lost its head office and the branches had to survive. Uh, and, I, and I'm just thinking about things that occur in liquidity. And I first learned about early warning indicators when the Iraqi army was amassing itself on the Kuwaiti border. Um, and then from there, I went to, to, to Dexia. Um, if anybody's familiar with Dexia, big European bank. In fact, um, it so happens that the head of risk management is actually here today, also at that time. Um, and at that time, it's very interesting because you have a great, everybody should take a quick look at this, a great uh, brochure today. But it talks about, on page 9, about central banks have often stepped in to provide short-term liquidity to banks under duress. And so when I think about preparation, I go back a little bit and think about my days at Dexia, where um, we had to borrow $55 billion at one point through the different emergency liquidity, liquidity vehicles that they had presented at the Fed. So it, again, reinforced my idea about um, being prepared. So today at, at, at CCB and most banks, the way we are prepared is we 
we run liquidity stress tests. Um, and um, well, let me take, a, I'm sorry, a step back. So the evolving, how have the, the um, impact on recent regulations evolved on bank liquidity? It's also interesting, it's an, another nice, if you want to have a good definition on page, I think it's on page 10, Quantify did a great job, it's about LCR. And the LCR metric aims to ensure financial institution maintains an adequate level of unencumbered high quality liquid assets to cover the outflows. And the key to that comment is the outflows. So the changing in recent regulations have defined for the banks a stress environment with, with a prescribed quantification of the outflows. So um, that's something we have to be, be, be prepared for and be very much aware of. Um, and I guess the other thing we constantly monitor is um, uh, our contingency funding plan, which um, looks at different stress tests and different uh, reactions and action plans depending upon the particular stress level. Um, so I guess that's what uh, my most pressing, pressing issue is, is always um, the evolving regulatory impact on liquidity for banks. And how this optimization of funding um, is going on from your point of view, like uh, maybe a fund transfer pricing or something along these lines? Uh? Well, I mean, you know, that's a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great question because um, funds transfer pricing really only originated, I'd like to say, in 2008, uh, 2009, and regulators and banks realized that um, bank practitioners were not actually um, valuing the, the cost of liquidity. So uh, whether it be my bank or most banks, a uh, bank would put on a loan for three years, and their cost of liquidity, if they were funding it for, on a three-month basis, they would think the cost of liquidity was the cost of funding for three months. Um, so as a consequence, banks very quickly learned that that's not the case. Um, and what was implemented was funds transfer pricing. So what funds transfer pricing does, it is the tool that banks employ to quantify in the first place, you have to quantify your cost of liquidity, so it's forced bank practitioners to quantify the lowest cost of liquidity. Um, it is then allocated among the different business lines. I think on an earlier panel, someone talked about how are traders incentivized and in how they manage their positions. Uh, I think in the, in the bank space, um, FTP is not only an allocation of the risk versus the war reward to the different business lines, but it also it enables uh, the bank to incentivize uh, through the FTP process. So uh, FTP process is really a, a, an evolving process. Uh, I like to say that um, it sort of pits the business lines versus treasury because treasury, the treasury is usually the, the sort of the gatekeeper of liquidity. And I also like to say that the least favored person in the bank is usually the person that's responsible for the fund, FT, funds transfer pricing allocation. So that is a, a direct consequence of uh, the um, change of liquidity uh, of recent regulations and how banks have implemented new systems to be able to measure and monitor uh, the liquidity risks. Uh, Stephen, maybe you can comment as uh, your experience with FTP and most hated person is uh, similar or in your bank it's... Uh... Yeah, I mean FTP is a, a, a huge issue. Um, also, since we're part of a, a global bank, then you get into some interesting discussions because you generally have a global process and then you're trying to fit within it. And as Frank kind of talked about, we also have the US liquidity stress tests, which give you different numbers. And then we end up, um, and then you get into a discussion, you know, clearly there's an interest rate component of transfer pricing, but it's a liquidity component that's probably the most challenging. Um, and, and then, you know, Frank didn't really get a chance to go the further in it, but, you know, pick your liquidity metric. Because, you know, the US banks have implemented the LCR we're moving to the net stable funding ratio, which I think we're supposed to be on by January of 2018. There's a draft agreement out from the regulators, but it won't be final until next year. Um, and in addition, you know, a part of Basel was each of the banks is supposed to do their own ad hoc stress tests. So under enhanced prudential standards, all the banks are doing their own stress tests. You're supposed to do th a minimum of three monthly. The bigger the bank you are, the more you're going to get to do. Um, and that, that may drive your liquidity as well. Kind of the other interesting thing about enhanced prudential standards is, as opposed to the LCR and NSFR, when people generally have the same, met, same metrics um, under enhanced prudential standards, each bank is 
kind of responsible for, for deriving their own assumptions. So, you know, pick your metric. You can charge your cost of funds on an LCR basis, an NSFR basis, or your most binding EPS basis. And then again, um, you know, that has an impact on our clients, clearly, you know, and also, you know, clearly as part of a global bank, then, you know, we're, my prior employer wanted us to use a mix of 50% LCR, 50% NSFR. <laughs> That's very scientific, yes. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was quite nice. It, it, it's never quite right, but on average, you're okay. Okay. And um, Gonzalo, from the point of view of trading and dealing with clients? Uh, uh, right. Be, uh, yes, yeah. uh, obviously, um, uh, it comes, obviously, from the risk function and the treasury function centrally, how much is the cost for, for the front office. But what we have to do is make sure how do we uh, include or, or in, uh, transfer that into every single trade. And that's why CBA desks are there in the middle, and we have a, a selective specific pricing in how to transfer that into a trade by trade. In some cases, uh, it depends on institutions. I, I, I find that you mentioned we, we, we know that some institutions have, uh, are more affected by one restriction versus the other. Um, uh, so the, depending on, in, on our case, depending on what is more restrictive for a business or for a desk, that's what uh, typically we in, uh, include in the pricing because that's a limitation. Uh, but what we do it, uh, at the CBA desk is also uh, evaluate how much is the future profile of the trade and uh, the, the counterparty that you are dealing with. So how every time that you trade, you generate some credit risk. How much is the additional, let's say, cost of protection against that credit risk that you could buy the CDS directly against that kind of party or, or uh, an index or something to, to hedge against the product? Once you identify that at the CBA desk, it depends on each desk. Maybe a, 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 a particular desk takes interest swaps, 30-year swaps, and they maintain them for, for a year. So you may need to price that calculation differently than another desk that rotates their portfolio on a weekly basis. So there are different ratios that you may want to apply on the upfront pricing of that, on the impact that you will have against BDAS. Remember, as, as we mentioned, before 2008, when, when I was ma making markets, we didn't care what, what kind of party we were trading with. The BDAS was the BDAS, and that's it. Uh, we manage our position now. Uh, the end BDAS contemplates CVA, XVA, MBA, etc. I think now it's time to ask uh, Stephen my favorite question. So what keeps you awake uh, during the night? What's your most pressing uh, liquidity? You deal with liquidity 24 mm -hmm. seven, right? So. Yeah, I mean, as Frank talked about, clearly we saw the markets last night. You know, my market risk colleagues were ready at 7 a.m. for an exciting day and they were kind of bored. Um, uh, yeah, we were all, and, and my funding colleagues said nothing happened on the secured market or the unsecured market. So it, that was a very pleasant thing. But you're trying to anticipate what might happen. And again, um, in the current thing, you, can, you know what's happened in the past, but tomorrow is always different. Right. Um, but you try to run some tests, right? Yeah, uh, I, I mean, we're running tests. I, I mean, again... You know, we, we, we have the Sineros, we have the CFP, you know, we, we, we've tried to surmise what might happen. Um, you know, a, a lot of, you know, the, these days the regulators are challenging a lot on overnight treasury repos, you know, the things which are big numbers but not necessarily historically a problem. So it, it's trying to decide what might happen next. Are liquidity stress as well understood? Is it uh, there, there is no ambiguity about them or how to run them and uh, I, I, the, about the results? Or it's, uh... I think there's still a great deal of confusion. You know, U.S. banks were a year or two ahead. The foreign banks rolled them out this year. Um, every bank has kind of implemented them differently with different tools. Um, and then also trying to explain them to management, you know, who, pro who, who has a good grasp of the LCR, could, a decent grasp for the NSFR, but now you, you, you're throwing three or four more things at them that are ever-changing. Uh, 
it may be interesting to ask uh, all panelists, uh, because they represent very geographically distinct uh, banks, right? So uh, what do they think is the uh, biggest um, difference in terms of uh, liquidity treatment and uh, regulatory kind of uh, regulations uh, regarding liquidity? Maybe, Frank, start with you, like... Uh, um, so you, it, it's... Um uh, so the difference in the, uh, so it's, it's a challenge, um, as Steve mentioned, because you have the local, you have the global. I think most banks, though, um, including ourselves, we start at the, at the top with the, the basal regulations, and then as you drill down, and we're conservative, so we uh, employ, uh, in general, um, more conservative applications. One of the interesting things that Steve mentioned is that it, in a lot of these stress tests, identification of, of liquidity, value liquidity, there is a subjective component uh, in, in parts of it. And the regulators want that and enable you to do that. But it does, uh, because there is no one set guideline that everybody um, is, is following, um, it, it does develop that there's differences between the different banks. Um, but I do think the subjective nature of it is what the big challenge is for most banks. But um, our experiences and my experiences is, is with on the, from on the regulator side, if there's any regulators here today. I think that uh, as long as you can um, have good historicals and, and credible, um, you add credibility to your subjective decisions or, or uh, identification of your subjective factors, that, that that's what they want you to see. They want to see you identifying and thinking about it as much as what the actual numbers are. They have to be reasonable, but they want to make sure that you're doing that um, extra, extra thought. Um, and, and you just bring up, you know, you think about what... Oh, I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. Sorry. Who'd you vote for? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, no, I just, we just said there's a lot of subjectivity to uh, stress tests, to models that you run internally. Um, uh, your stability deposits, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's, a, it's a challenge, I think, for the banks and the regulators because we don't have one, um, you know, s one, uh, s one simple, um, shall we say, template to follow in most cases. Um, just one last thing. When we talked about what you should think about, um, you really, there's, you, you never know what's going to occur. I mean, you know, even last night, you know, could you imagine two years ago that, you know, Donald Trump would, would win the election, so, or a Brexit, et cetera. Um, I mean, I, I recollect at my times at, for example, at, at Dexia, um, we were one of the top ranked banks, top rated safest banks in the world, and then the world blew up. So in your scenarios and stress tests, you always have to call what we call the worst of the worst scenario. Uh, Stephen, uh, what's your impression comparing uh, U.S. regulators, European regulators? Would you say who is stricter or uh, it's different in different uh, aspects? Yeah. Very different, and, and there's a certain independence on the U.S. side you might not see throughout Europe. Um, you know, it varies country by country. Um, but, you know, and, and also we worked a little bit with the bank being regulated by the PRA, and that they're very much into the reverse stress test. Um, you know, the Fed is more into challenging you. They, they don't, they're not big fans of the reverse stress test in the U.S. Um, you know, and it, but also through the regulatory colleges, they're all learning from one another. So you, you, you're seeing um, a lot of development across the market. You know, intraday is beginning to come in. You know, the... Um, I think the PRA was relatively advanced on, on intraday because of the chaps. Um, but then, you know, the U.S. is beginning to talk about it. We don't haven't implemented the Basel rule yet. Um, ECB is just talking about it, but HKMA is pushing it for it as well. So you're, you're seeing multiple – they're all following each other at different speeds. And, um, <clears throat> Gonzalo, in terms of uh, margins, right, definitely U.S. regulators are first, right, when we discussed – um, uh, among themselves, uh, Frank and Stephen didn't think that uh, these uh, margin requirements are big issues for their banks yet. So do you agree that uh, U.S. regulators are always ahead? Do you deal with other regulator, uh, regulators? For we did. We, I particularly have a global reach. So I, 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 this year I, I had a trip to Asia, including the discussion with uh, Japan, uh, Japanese regulators. Um, and uh, there's a lot of consistency, as, as he mentioned. 
Uh, why? Because uh, many of the ideas come from G20 meetings. They are filtered through Basel. And I know that U.S. regulators have direct talks with the European counterparts in particular. Uh, so for the, for the new rules, we know that they are pretty homogeneous. Although, yes, the U.S. regulators have a, a very strict plan that they adhere to in terms of timel timeliness and uh, uh, specific approvals that uh, uh, regulators in Europe and Japan were a little more relaxed. They ha gave more uh, generic approvals. But I want to highlight something that uh, was mentioned before, I think by Frank, uh, about stress and, and the importance of, of the view from risk management. When you are in the front office, you typically tend to move, although you have to have on your back of your mind what could be the worst that happened. You tend to move on what is the most probable outcome. And I remember three weeks ago or four weeks ago, we started to see some volatility in the market, uh, a Mexican peso, uh, currency moves, credit for swaps widening. And then two and a half weeks ago, Everything calmed down, the market rallied a little bit. And in our weekly meetings, uh, we say, uh, someone said, the market is already pricing the Clinton win. So everybody kind of relaxed, oh, okay, yes. But the risk manager uh, that was invited to that particular front office uh, said, since the markets are not very good at, pre at predicting outcomes from, you mentioned World War I to Brexit recently, a liquidity crisis. <laughs> liquidity crisis. <laughs> and probably, since you are observing this from clients as well, everybody's potentially one-sided. We have to be very concerned. And a bunch of stress tests started to circulate daily on what could be the outcome uh, of uh, yesterday's election. Uh, nothing happened, right? Uh, <laughs> so Almost, almost, yeah. Um, okay, thank you, uh, everyone. And uh, let me open the floor uh, for questions. Um, so uh, do we have uh, uh, anyone wants to uh, ask the whole panel or any panelist, panelist in particular? Uh, yeah, microphone is coming. Yep. My question's for Gonzalo. Uh, you had mentioned in the non-cleared market of derivatives, you're seeing with the increased margins and uh, lower liquidity, if fees are increasing. Are you starting to see that pass through to the cleared derivatives market at all when you're going to hedge a trade? Uh, no, I don't, I don't see, we don't see an impact of increasing cost there. But we see an increase in volume going into clearing. Uh, as I said, my, my, I traded for many, many years in credit markets, corporate bonds, and credit default swaps. Credit default swaps started to be clear many years ago, since 2010, I believe, nine. Uh, the index was the only thing that was cleared. And then certain single names, particularly the ones that were constituents of the indices. And now most of the credit default swaps are clear. The ones that are not cleared are the ones that are being impacted and that they have lost a little bit of the liquidity. They have lost that. So no additional cost, the direct answer. And now that we, want, uh, we know that Trump won, do you see any impact on regulation and the rules that you're dealing with? That is such a great question. Yeah. Um, I, I think that uh, I'll just jump in because uh, I think that uh, he is uh, very much pro anti regulation and I think he's very much against uh, or wants to look at the Dodd Frank Act. So I think that a lot of the work that's been done over the years could be, um, um, could be impacted uh, significantly. Uh, with, with a Trump presidency, um, I don't know. Um. Yeah, well, we saw uh, today in trading, actually, we were prepared for uh, a disastrous day. Uh, we, let's say, 20% decrease in the Mexican peso rate ended up like seven. Decrease of, dramatic decrease in, in, in equities, nothing happened really. Well, there was a rally today. 
so we move from the catastrophic scenario into a honeymoon, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> In one day. In one day. <laughs> Uh, and uh, our economies really are evaluating what could happen. Obviously, there's, a, uh, there's some dynamics between the Speaker of the House, uh, if re-elected uh, for Ryan, and uh, President-elect Donald Trump. Uh, but uh, even yesterday, somewhere, the chatter in, uh, across the industry in trading desk was that uh, at least the, the clear talk was about infrastructure, enhancing infrastructure. That may mean... Uh, 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 debt going higher initially, right, for, over the roof. Yeah, and a 10-year was up, I, I want to say, 20 bips today, right. 20 basis points today, I think, yeah, something. Uh, yes, know. or ended up le less than that, yeah. but, but yeah. It was, there was a yeah. steepening on the curve, yeah. right? Yeah. And uh, so we can see that increase, and definitely that will produce, if that uh, is approved, there's no ceiling for that, definitely we'll see more activity and a potential uh, higher GDP growth, right? Thanks. Yeah. Uh, but I think, I think the risk is it's going to be fast, I think, too. I think Trump has demonstrated a propensity to move very quickly. So if we do get changes, you'll, you should be prepared. We should be, they probably will come fast, that's for sure. That's what I would suggest. Should we introduce another stress test, like Trump test? Or? Yeah. What we don't for, for, uh, foresee or we are not relaxing is in the implementation of, of Dodd-Frank. We continue with the, with the efforts. Uh, we believe that, although costly, uh, eventually has uh, a positive impact on, on uh, reducing systemic risk globally. So. I think we have time for a couple more questions. Yeah. So, so I have a question regarding intraday liquidity. I would like to know from the participants what is feasible from a bank perspective in intraday uh, management and also from the regulators, or what are the expectations to improve on intraday monitoring, uh, especially on a large scale and on various products like equity, fixed income? How can you consolidate something realistically on intraday basis? Uh, Stephen, maybe? Yeah. Um, intraday is just challenging. Um, everyone is working toward it. The largest banks like JPM and Bank of New York are well advanced. Some, uh, the custody banks have, you know, been dealing with that with the, th the, the tri-party. Um, the rest of us are lagging a little behind. And I think the real problem is on the MIS trying to figure out who what's driving your intraday usage. I, I mean, you, everybody has, has their Fed account. They can see their bottom. They know how much money went out. You know, you, you know kind of when CLS goes out. But the rest of the day is kind of challenging. I, I think there's just a lot more work to be doing on intraday. And the regulators haven't driven that. It's not one of their top two of, two items at the moment. Yeah. I, I would agree with that. It's uh, but it's now on their radar. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's something that the banks. We're in a similar uh, stage at this point, but it's something we have to start looking at. Um, in addition to all the other things we're looking at. From us, from the front office, from the trading day side, you you don't you cannot handle your position or your trading activity based on a kind of complicated global model. So if the product has, adds a lot of uh, risk or uh, liquidity needs, what you have for now is some limits in terms of the volume, the notional sensitivities or so on. Uh, time probably for one more. Yep. Uh, one more question. Uh, so we've heard the buy side and uh, we've heard the sell side. And I see a mismatch on the prescriptiveness, let's say, of regulators. So for the banks, we have LCR and other ratios, and they say clearly this asset class is liquid, this other one less liquid, and I'm going to impose uh, this much of a haircut. While on the, on the buy side, they have just to uh, bucket their position based on uh, days to exit the position, and that's going to only happen in, in uh, 2018. Um, I was wondering what is your reaction, um, thinking bro broadly about the financial uh, stability on this um, mismatch um, in the regulatory approach? Uh, do we see a risk there, or is it fine? Your perspective. Uh, shadow banking. Uh, yes, uh, uh, we believe that that also is uh, uh, relevant. 
Um, but we cannot speak on behalf of regulators what, what's the, the coverage that they do. We believe that the biggest contributors to, to uh, systemic risk are the big financial institutions, the big market makers, the big banks. Uh, but the shadow banking also uh, adds to that systemic risk. You brought a very, very good point. Uh, every, every bank in, in general is not an advocate because uh, to put more regulations on our clients, but uh, uh, to observe that uh, systemic risk is the banks, but also the shadow banking activity. Um, in the end, if you regulate strongly the banks that provide the liquidity, that uh, trickles to your clients. Uh, there could be certain activity where it's disintermediated and that uh, may need to be regulated or, or have uh, other type of controls or monitoring. I think that there's a lot of monitoring as well. Right, Stephen? Um, having worked at two foreign banks with matched books, we've seen significant reduced liquidity in the repo market. You know, at quarter ends, you know, the repo market would spike and, you know, the, the rate would go over the unsecured rate. I mean, all of October it stayed over the unsecured rate. So, you know, we're seeing less and less liquidity in the repo market. You know, with the SLR, the U.S. banks are not really participating in the repo market to the level that they historically have. Most of the, the securities they have, they, they, they retain. Um, so, you know, there was an article in Risk Magazine about how all the French banks were pro financing the U.S. money market funds. <laughs> and right. now that's an interesting discussion, and now the French banks may not. So the question is, who will finance, you know, all that repo activity? And I think Treasury is concerned as well. Um, I think if there are uh, more questions, we can ask them um, after, uh, uh, during the reception. So let me uh, thank the panel. Um, it was a very interesting discussion. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I hope you agree. It was a very interesting discussion. I think we had some, some great uh, panelists, uh, both on the buy side and the sell side. Uh, I think a very uniformly high standard. Um, uh, we're going to have uh, uh, some reception, some, some uh, cocktails here, um, which I hope you can stay for. But I, I thought it would be worth uh, highlighting a couple of thoughts about what was talked about today. I think for, for what I saw in the buy side panel, definitely the amount of diversity in the approaches between the different firms, I think that that was very interesting. Uh, also the fact that a lot of it was investor driven, so a lot of the requirements, a lot of the, the, the things they were looking at were really driven by investors as opposed to the sell side panel where regulation, regu regulations seem to be driving, um, you know, driving um, uh, what's being done. Um, on this buy side panel, uh, stress testing, asset categorization, redemption risk, um, all, all subjects. Um, interesting that there's a, a number of new approaches, so some of the, the new um, data measures that are available from Market and from Bloomberg. Um, approaches that for the bigger firms, certainly from, from BlackRock, transaction cost modeling, um, redemption modeling, I think they're all areas of, of future uh, development that will be interesting. Um, on the sell side panel, um, you know, regulations. Uh, I think um, uh, uh, the uh, you know the, the comments around the the, um, the the similarities and the and the differences between the international regulations, I think, are quite interesting. Um, the different measures of liquidity um, that that are that are uh, that are in place. Um, the transfer pricing, the liquidity transfer pricing, that issue, and also the um, the fact that there's judgment. Um, in 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 this scenario, and stress testing also, I think I think was quite quite interesting. So I think and thanks very much to to both panels, and it was uh, it was great. So please join us for for cocktails. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.